Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Portland Cocktail Week Distance Learning. Um, I know our certification students are having a particularly exciting week because they've had their final EWA class. We are we have one more drop and dram and one more of these to go uh, before it is time to sit for final assessments. So for all of you who've been participating in the program, thank you so much for all the time that you've dedicated to the program. And I have nothing but full confidence that there are gonna be a lot of certificates coming from the Scottish Qualifications Authority. Um, so today we're here with my dear friend Cameron George again. Somehow I keep roping him into spending his entire Wednesday with me. So thank you, Cam. Um, and he is definitely outdoing me with his Ardbeg themed setup. I have not quite yet converted all of my home decor to the Ardbeg colorway, but uh, don't worry, it is in progress. No one, no one fear. Um, as you all know from the channel, uh, Cam is the U.S. Ambassador for Ardbeg, and he is here with us today uh, to talk to us today about blending the ultimate single malt. Um, Cam is going to give us the ins and outs of how Dr. Bill, Colin Gordon, and the whiskey creation team work together to develop what I consider to be the perfect single malt blends. Uh, so we are about to get into it, but before we do, Make sure you do the things I ask you to do every week, which is like us on Facebook uh, here at facebook.com slash pdxcw. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to that YouTube channel at youtube.com slash pdxcw. Uh, maybe next week you swap them up, watch them on a different channel, like and subscribe to the opposite one than you normally watch on. Whatever feels good, we're into it. Uh, follow us on Instagram at PDXCW, where you can always find out what is coming up next, what cool classes we're going to rope Cameron George into teaching next. Um, make sure you comment below, ask your questions, especially our certification students. I have a feeling today is going to be packed full of info, so you'll have plenty of questions. And today is October the 5th which makes tomorrow October the 6th. And October the 6th is in fact the day that applications for Portland Cocktail Week in real life close. Uh, so make sure that before 11.59 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow, you have got your application in at pdxcw.com slash apply. We're gonna have a ton of fun programming with Ardbeg and Glenn Marangi, and we would love for you to be there, but you can't be there unless you fill out the application. So get that done. And with that, Cameron, it looks like you're getting ready for the tasting of my dreams. Tell me a little bit about what's going on over there. Yeah, absolutely. So as always, it is a pleasure and a blessing just to get to see you. I uh, absolutely love spending my Wednesdays with you and everybody who's involved in the, uh, in the program right now, as well as everybody who's watching online. Um, I encourage you all to sign up for the Edinburgh Whiskey Academy Ardbeg in Portland Cocktail Week Scotch Whiskey Diploma. Uh, the certification is incredibly handy and it allows you to spend like-minded time with or with time, time with like-minded folk like uh, Brittany and I. So that's always a huge plus. I think that deserves two thumbs up. Today, we're gonna be nerding out on uh, the whiskey pr production team's approach to assembling the Ardbeg whiskeys. Um, I know it does say blending in, in the headline of the class and in the title. Dr. Bill and our whiskey creation team, they absolutely hate when we use that word, but I think it's the best one for making people feel comfortable and at home with understanding the process of how these whiskeys are put together. So we'll discuss that process a little bit. But last week we started off on the right foot by making a cocktail. So I feel like I should probably do that exact same thing again because I'm at home again for the first time in about a week. Uh, so I deserve a cocktail. So I'm gonna do that if that's all right with you. I would love nothing more personally, so please. All right, let's get some of these bottles just kind of slightly adjusted here. We can go ahead. If you up. want, you can just go ahead and put them in a box and I'll DM you my address. Um, you just right. get those. I'll get them out of the way for you. Sure. I got it. Okay. All right. Totally. totally right. Uh, today, I'm just going to make a super easy, very simple cocktail to be a lightly shaken cocktail served up in this beautiful little Nick and Nora glass here. I'm going to go ahead and use a little bit of Ardbeg Wee Beastie to make the heart and soul of this cocktail. 
This is one of my favorite whiskeys that we make at Ardbeg. So I'll just give it two quick ounces a wee beastie. There we are. I'm gonna come behind that with a little bit of lime juice, freshly squeezed, of course, from these limes that I painstakingly grabbed from the QFC, the Kroger's near my house there. Awesome. Really went out of your way. <laughs> really went out of the way. Yeah, as soon as I got up there, uh, as soon as I caught out of the rental car yesterday, I was like, all right, need to have ingredients to make a cocktail tomorrow, tomorrow morning. So I went to the store, did the darn thing. Um, if you know me, then you know that vermouth is one of my absolute favorite things and one of my first loves. So I'm going to go ahead and use about three quarters of an ounce of dry vermouth, three quarters to an ounce, that three quarter there. And then one of my other favorite ingredients, one that I was hipped to while I was in Portland last year, this delicious vinegar and tamarind cordial. It's absolutely fantastic. Amazing yeah. stuff. I'm going to go ahead and use about half an ounce of the tamarind cordial. And then just going to give it a nice little friendly kiss of some orgeat as well. Set those bad boys down and use a little bit of this orgeat, about a quarter of an ounce. I don't know why it took so long for us to figure out that, hey, you should probably have a cocktail while you're teaching these classes. It I just go so much better. I don't know what we were doing the whole time. Mistakes. That's what we're. That's what we was were making. making. We were learning. Exactly. Right. <laughs> we're not drinking. We're always learning. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and follow the Angostura with a little bit of ice there. Shake it real quick. Good. Fine strain your cocktails for sure. That's pretty. Oh, that is pretty. All right. And then just a little garnish, orange peel over the top of it. And boom, there you go. Uh, well, enjoy, my friend. And speaking of enjoying, um, I feel like we might have some people watching that might want to replicate this cocktail since you just tasted through Wee Beastie and talked about it yesterday. Um, and Quisha was wondering, what is the name, of the brand name of the cordial that you use? Yeah, absolutely. So this cordial is called Sum, S-O-M, or Sum. It's from Portland. Let's see if I can get the camera. I know you're not going to focus for me. There we go. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, so it's actually local in Portland. It's really delicious. It's slightly tart. Um, a little bit of sweetness in there as well. Hence why I used a little bit of the orgeat uh, to kind of come behind it as well. The vinegar shows really, really well on it. And I opted to go with lime as opposed to lemon. Because uh, there is there is just really this fresh kind of lime peel that hides beneath the surface of most of the Ardbeg single malts. Um, so it's just an absolutely delicious cocktail. Oh, well, I can't right. think of a person who deserves it more. Um, and Tanette wants to know, was the Orgeat infused with anything or just straight nope. up Orgeat? Mm -mm. Just, just straight up Orgeat. Just straight up Orgeat. Love that. Quisha, you will have to pick some up during Portland Cocktail Week. You're absolutely right. You can probably do it when you're leaving one of Cam's 97 classes or events that I've <laughs> once again bullied him into doing so that I can spend more time with him because that's how I do things around here. But enough about me bullying Cam because David Blackmore's not here today. So this is actually the stream that's not about bullying Cameron George. So we have an opportunity here to just let you shine and bask in your glow, Cam. So are you going to tell us what do what is Dr. Bill doing right now? What is he thinking? How does he come up with all of this stuff? And how does poor sweet Jillian manage it all? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, they are really the two kind of twin towers of the Ardbeg distillery. Um, technically, there are three towers of the Ardbeg distillery. Obviously, 
The whole operation runs because of Colin Gordon, who's the distillery manager. He operates and effectively manages day-to-day uh, production of the new made spirit at Ardbeg. Um, and that's very different than making whiskey, right? New made spirit is the, is the heart and soul of which all of the whiskeys are made upon. But remember with single malt scotch whiskey, we get to break it down into those four words. Single is going to be in reference of the distillery of origin can only come from one place, right? Malt is in reference to the malt, uh, to the grain of origin having to be made from malted barley. Scotch means that it needs to be made in Scotland on copper pot stills with, uh, in batch distillation. And then whiskey means that it needs to be matured for at least three years. So with Colin's role as the distillery manager, he effectively makes all of the new made spirit, but it's not whiskey until after it's gone through maturation, right? So uh, Colin is, is integral to the production process of the whiskeys, but he doesn't make the whiskey in and of itself. Of course, at the distillery as well, you'll also have Jackie Thompson. While Jackie doesn't technically sit on the, uh, the whiskey creation team from Ardbeg, she's a massive figure. She's a figure that looms larger than life uh, in everything that we do at the distillery. She is Isla encapsulated. Um, she sits on more councils on Isla and, and committees on Isla than anybody else on the island. I believe once she was up to having been on at least 26 different committees on the island. There's basically a committee for everything on Isla, which I think is quite interesting and very, very funny. Um, but then at the very head of the whiskey production uh, team, you'll have Jillian McDonald. Uh, and Jillian is an esteemed blender. Uh, she's an esteemed whiskey maker herself. So she has a little over 15 years of experience and history in the Scotch whiskey industry. Um, or I should say in the whiskey industry, because she has also worked at other distilleries such as like Pindarin as well, um, which is obviously a, a wonderful whiskey, uh, whiskey producer that does not sit in Scotland. And then you'll also have the head, uh, the head of the snake, the man with, you know, who is, who is all about all of the action. And that's Dr. Bill Lumsden. Um, Dr. Bill Lumsden is a graduate from Harriet Watt Distill uh, Distilling Institute and in University. Um, he, major, he majored in distillation and distillation sciences. He's a biochemical engineer by trade as well, uh, and somebody who has a little over 36 years in the whiskey industry. Dr. Bill is the most highly awarded whiskey maker on the planet, um, and also our relevant bad or our resident bad boy at Ardbeg Distillery and Glenn Morangi as well. He oversees uh, the head of production for both, uh, both of the sites and both of the brands as well. So both of those individuals who sit on the, the Ardbeg whiskey production team um, are absolutely incredible. They're some of my favorite people to go to, you know, to spend dinner with, to go have cocktails with, and also to learn about the act of making whiskey from as well. So that's a little bit about them. Does David Blackmore know that he is not the bad boy of Ardbeg <laughs> and Glen and G, that it is in fact Dr. Bill? <laughs> He does not. Because <laughs> I was like, I, he gives me vibes. Like he thinks he's the bad boy, but we all know Dr. Bill is the the mad scientist behind all the fun things we get to see along with Jillian and Colin. So I'm really excited to hear more about a lot of these projects that, you know, I know that we'll be talking a little bit about some of the core range, but like a lot of the things I think maybe we don't get to cover as much, even in the certification program, because we're so focused on learning about scotch as a category that it's a little more difficult to be like, hey, we're going to spend all day talking about art core. Yep, exactly. And that's why I wanted to pull these things down from the office is to make sure that we got a chance to speak about the whiskeys that we make at Ardbeg past just the core range. These five whiskeys on the table here on, on to my right are some of the most highly awarded whiskeys on the planet. Um, and those are the whiskeys that we are well known for and well versed in yeah. making make every single day. But the other whiskeys, the ones that are gonna be in front of me, to flip those bad boys around, the, these whiskeys showcase the more experimental side of the distillery and the way that we love to push the, uh, the bounds of what, of what is possible in the single malt category. And within that, what's possible within the heavily peated single malt category as well. Um, because it's not necessarily a category that's 
really well known for its innovation. Whiskey around the world as a, as a global category is, is, is a fairly handcuffed category, right? You think about it, um, if you think about the 30,000 foot view down on the greater category of whiskey, fermentation, distillation of cereal grain that's then matured in, in oak vessels. So we already have a precedent for and, and, and rules and regulations for what the overarching category can be classified as, right? So with single malts, single malts have this element and pedigree of, of and an air of kind of um, being a staunchy category, a category that moves not necessarily in leaps and bounds, but, but by creeps and inches. Um, so Ardbeg has always been this brand, at least since 1997, when we relaunched the brand, that has really tried to break single malt out of its box and continue to push it in directions that may make some people uncomfortable. And that's totally fine. Not every single whiskey needs to be for you. In fact, one of the things that drew me to Ardbeg initially was the way that the whiskey creation team approaches whiskey production they're aimed at having or starting conversations. And with any great conversation, there should be two sides to the conversation, somebody who's for and somebody who's against. So if you're against any of the whiskeys from Ardbeg, that's totally fine. That's absolutely fine. We welcome you into the fold anyway, because you're a valued member of the conversation that we're trying to start. I love that. And I love that y'all release products for conversation before they're more widely released to be like, Hey, what do you think about this? You drink art bet all the time. Like what, it, what do you, how do you feel? Absolutely. You know, I think uh, that's kind of why people are so like emotionally invested in the brand, because there's so many things that allow all of us to be a part of it, you know, from like the way the marketing is geared to the fact that you release things for conversation to like all of the Ardbeg clubs and Highland games and Ardbeg day celebrations. It makes everybody feel like they're a part of the brand. Absolutely. You know, it, it, it really does feel like you, once you're on the inside of the brand, you feel a sense of ownership over it. And I hear it all the time whenever I'm traveling, you know, people are like, Oh, well, we did this really amazing Ardbeg day event in, 2016 and they haven't done another one here. Like I want another Ardbeg day here in say Chicago, for instance. I'm, I'm only recalling that because the most recent complaint that we hadn't done an Ardbeg day event was coming from Chicago. So it was very triggering and very <laughs> fresh in the memory. But you know, people mean the best by it. It's because they genuinely love the brand. They love the product and they love the way that it marries a sense of place uh, and provenance to the actual whiskey and the liquid that we're actually getting to experience as well there, right? Love it. So um, I wanted to chit chat just a little bit as I kind of finish this cocktail here. Mm. It's so delicious. The vinegar is so, so beautiful. I'm, that is amazing. If you're not drinking, if you don't incorporate drinking vinegars into your cocktails, I, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with you. They're absolutely fantastic. And they add a really beautiful amount of acidity to any cocktail and any art bag is really looking to, to play off of some citric notes and some uh, like uh, acid or acidulating notes as well. So this is a great cocktail. Well, now that you all have some art bags at home to choose from, you better get your drinking vinegar assortment lined up because you've got a lot of delicious cocktails in your future if you do. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Right. So you've obviously seen I've swapped out one glass for another. And I'm going to pour myself just a little bit of Ardbeg 10 year old. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Dr. Bill and a little bit more about Jillian and a little bit more about Colin as we uh, as I pour myself a dram here. And then we're actually going to go ahead and show a video after that as well. So give us a couple minutes of your attention. I'll talk to you a little bit about Colin first. So Colin Gordon, distillery manager at Ardbeg. Colin actually is a, the newest addition to the Ardbeg um, uh, whiskey production team. Uh, he comes to us from Lagavulin and, uh, and also Port Ellen malting facilities. Uh, he also did a brief stint at Colila, uh, as you can tell. Those three, or hopefully as you can tell, or hopefully as you know, those two distilleries plus the malting facility, so those three operations are all owned and operated by Diageo. Um, Diageo, I believe, 
is one of the one of the most interesting companies on the planet. Their Scotch whiskey offerings are immense. They have some beautiful, beautiful distilleries. They have some beautiful brands as well. And what that means, they are really great at farming and building talent, of which uh, Colin Gordon is one of or was one of their most esteemed uh, individuals operating in the whiskey production area for them. So Colin actually used to run the distillery at Lagavulin and at the same time was the site manager uh, for Port Ellen Malting facility. I met Colin for the first time in 2018, I believe, yeah, 2018, when he took David and I around, the, uh, around Port Ellen, around the Maltings. And it became very, very clear, very, very quickly uh, that he was just absolutely whip smart and incredibly brilliant and, and just really well versed in not only knowledge of, of the maltings, uh, but then also knowledge of how what he produced as site manager at Port Ellen affected the whiskeys or affected the new made spirits that were being made at distilleries all around the island. Again, seven of the nine distilleries on Isla utilize Port Ellen malt. Um, or malted barley coming from the malting facility in Port Ellen, which I think is incredibly important. Now, I mentioned a little bit about Jillian McDonald, um, Jillian being the, the previous head of whiskey distillation for Pendaren Distillery. She and Dr. Bill absolutely hit it off at a conference, at a conference uh, that was pertaining to the arts and science of distillation. So the two of them immediately kind of hit it off. And she actually joined the, joined the whiskey creation team back in 2015. So she's been with us now for a little over seven, year, a little over seven years at Ardbeg. Um, just an incredible wealth of knowledge and somebody who is uh, very, very well versed in whiskey distillation and applied whiskey distillation sciences as well. So she has quickly become somebody who is uh, of, of high esteem within the Glen Morangy and Ardbeg uh, portfolio as well. And then, as I mentioned, Dr. Bill Lumsden, the man, the myth, the absolute legend, the person who I would say is the funnest dinner date, but then will also stick you with the bill uh, very, very quickly as well. Dr. Bill is uh, is a whiskey uh, is a whiskey engineer by by trade, obviously, um, but he also has a massive love of wine. I am very very sure that one day when he retires, he's in nowhere near close to retiring as of yet. But one way when he does retire, I'm sure that he will go run or own and operate a small winery somewhere, probably in France or maybe even somewhere in South America. We'll see, we'll see what, what uh, time has in store for him. But the reason that I said and made the joke about Dr. Bill never touching the bill when it comes uh, is because he is, uh, he's, he's somebody who always chooses all of the wines whenever we go to dinner. And then halfway through the dinner, Dr. Bill will excuse himself to go to the restroom and disappear for the rest of the evening until he inevitably messages you, hey, should we have a a beer before you go to bed. And I'm like, but you just left this dinner. It's, it's too funny. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like he's like, I paid my part. I picked out all of the wine. So now it's your turn to pick up the bill. Exactly, exactly. Right. So one of the things Dr. Bill and I have discussed over, over the years and at, at length as well is the relationship uh, that single malt has with vatting or blending or marrying. You can, it can go by a couple of different terms and it can be called a couple of different things. So if we rewind back to our definition of single malt scotch whiskey, the very first word in that, single, that doesn't mean that you only have to use whiskey coming from one individual cask. That would be single barrel or that would be single cask, right? So even in single malt scotch whiskey production, for sustainability's sake and as well as consistency's sake, um, there is an element of blending or vatting that's employed as well. So even when we're talking about Ardbeg 10-year-old, which makes up the heart and soul of everything else that we do at the distillery, this is a marrying or a blending or a vatting of, of all ex-bourbon barrels. So we don't use any sherry cask. We don't use any pork cask. There's no sorts of, of wine casks that are being utilized in this as well. This is all ex-bourbon barrel. A marriage of some first fill, some second fill, and some third fill. 
So those of us who have gone through the EWA course um, will be will have learned what a first, second, and third fill X bourbon barrel all are. But for those of us who are watching on either Facebook or YouTube, you may not necessarily have this context yet. And I think it's incredibly important context for how we build each of the whiskeys at Ardbeg Distillery, both in the core range, as well as our limited and Ardbeg Day releases as well. So by the time a cask is used here in the United States, the average use or the average length of maturation time here in the U.S. is somewhere between five and nine years for a, bur for a bourbon whiskey. And between five and nine years old, an ex-bourbon barrel or a, a, an American white oak barrel or an ASB, an American standard bur barrel, will have about 80% of extractable oak lactones and lignin, especially, especially those two things left within the tyloses or like the radial rings in the hemicellulose of the oak. So there's still a lot of tread left on that tire, proverbially so speaking there, right? So after five to nine years, you still have between 70 to 80% of extractable oak lactones and then lignin. Um, those two things together are what give you the aromatic of like um, uh, of soft vanilla or vanillin is, is the technical term for the comp of the compound. Um, it'll also give you the, the aromatic of things like cinnamon or clove, basically the kitchen cabinet spices that we refer to when we think bourbon whiskey, or when we think rye whiskey, or when we think about anything that is gracing new American oak, right? It's oak lactones and lignin that are generally the, the culprits of that flavor profile. Now, those casks will actually be sent from here in the US over to Scotland, and we like them to be shipped to us whole. So we don't want them to be broken down. Oftentimes in Scotland, uh, you will see uh, the casts are shipped palletized or they're shipped broken down. Um, and then they're to be recoupered in, main, in mainland Scotland. Oftentimes they're recoupered into things like um, hogsheads, right? Like an American hogshead cask is effectively where they took two, basic, basically two broken down American bourbon barrels, shipped them over to Scotland, and then they were recoupered into one. Um, it's not a, a, not necessarily a one for one. It's not like two become one. It's really the two become like one and a half more or less in terms of the, in terms of the overall volume. Um, the hogsheads are generally somewhere right around 63 to 75, um, uh, gallons, right? Where an American, whereas a bourbon barrel is about 53, right? So those two become one and a half or so right, right around in there. With Ardbeg, because we like, and with Glen Morangy, because we like our casts to be shipped to us whole, that means that the casts are never broken down. And that also means that, that, that the oak is, isn't necessarily as tired or as dried out by the time it actually ends up getting there as well, right? Which is for, you can have a conversation about that. Um, I'm not refuting or, or disbelieving that, that hogs head casts when they're recoupered are still of amazing quality because we do have some hoggies laying around at both Ardbeg and Glen Morangy Distillery as well. Now, from there, we'll go ahead and use that, that X bourbon barrel. The first time we, we put whiskey into it, that's going to be called a first fill X bourbon. The second that that whiskey is dis disgorged and then emptied out of the cask and we fill it again, that's a second fill X bourbon barrel. And the third time we, we disgorge and then refill that cask, that'll be the last time for the most part that we're utilizing that cask at Ardbeg. At Glen Morangy, they will not use third filler casks um, for any of the core range whiskeys. Maybe for some rare experiments, um, off and on again, they may use them. But at Ardbeg, even an Ardbeg 10-year-old, we will sometimes use some third fill X bourbon barrel because that allows the profile of the distillery to speak really, really, really high and with a lot of volume, as opposed to making it a little bit more about that oak. Because again, remember, that oak lactone and a lot of that lignin is being pulled or rendered into solution because a lot of it, because alcohol is a great solvent. Our alcohol is fantastic for pulling things like oak lactones into solution. It's not so great at pulling things like tannin into solution, but things, but the cast like European oak have, um, uh, which generally European oaks are 
um, are oftentimes utilized to mature things like sherry wines or even just wines in general. Water is is tannins like best friend. It's it's bosom pal and really good buddy, right? So things like wines, like sherries, those are great for removing and pulling tannin into solution. Luckily, American oak has much more lignin and oak lactones than it does tannin, right? So that's a great conversation to get to have. So the reason that our big 10 year old is so important for us is because yes, first, second, and third fill ex bourbon barrels mean that that whiskey is wholly matured in ex bourbon and ex bourbon casts make up the lion's share of everything else that we do at Ardbeg as a distillery, right? Which means that at Ardbeg, it's not to say that we finish whiskeys. I, I prefer the, t uh, the term that we assemble them because some whiskey will be matured wholly in those first, those second, and those third fill ex bourbon barrels. And some whiskey will be matured in a modifying cask, so to speak. Or some of that whiskey, in the case of something like an Ardbeg Supernova, some of this whiskey will be wholly matured in, in ex bourbon barrels as well. But some of the whiskey is incredibly heavily, heavily, heavily peated, way past 100 and, 105 parts per million, right? Where normal Ardbeg spec is 55 to 65. So even in Ardbeg Supernova, even though it's all ex bourbon, there's been some marrying of classic Ardbeg spirit and then also some Ardbeg that has been peated much more heavily than our normal spec of malted barley is peated to as well. Make a little bit of sense there? It makes sense to me. I would, we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to get to those. But um, I would like the supernova is what I would like to be the first thing I put into my go bag when it's time for me to go to the hospital and give birth to this child. So that way the minute it's out of here, I can just drown myself in supernova. supernova. I'm very excited about it. Um, I miss being able to enjoy all the PD boys with all of you right now, but it's for a good cause. So, and I will make up for lost time. Uh, don't mm -hmm. worry. Uh, <laughs> but for the questions, um, Someone wanted to know what subject Dr. Bill's doctorate is in. Mm, um, that is great. I believe it's organic chemistry. I'll have to double check though. He seems like an organic chemistry guy. Yeah. Uh, when I was in college, I took anal my major was analytical chemistry specifically because I wanted nothing to do with organic chemistry. So yeah. uh, I really appreciate that he he really picked up the mantle there and ran with it. So mm -hmm. thanks, Dr. Bill, for doing that for me. I, um, will, I will really quickly mention it as well because there are a few um, distillers in in the Scotch whiskey world that have um, honorary doctorates, but still use the term doctor. Um, Dr. Bill Lumsden is genuinely an earned doctorate, um, st a studied doctorate. It is not, it's not an honorary doctorate. I have always, I always love to make that distinction and I will not name the distillers with honorary doctorates that go by doctor. Yeah. We'll have to save that for maybe one of our private sessions. Exactly. <laughs> private but, conversation, yeah. But Dr. Beale is the real deal. He is a doctor, white papers and all, sent mm -hmm. whiskey to space. He's our guy. So um, cool. someone did, uh, what, going back to barrels being sent from the U.S. to Scotland um, and a lot of them being broken down beforehand, not for our bag, but for other distilleries. Is that just for more efficient shipping? Yeah, yeah, exactly. More efficient, uh, more efficient shipping. And they're, they're more than likely also being sold, not necessarily to an individual, to individual distilleries, but they're being sold to like a barrel broker um, who then will make the connection for the distilleries in, in Scotland. That's generally how that works. But with Glen Morangy and Ardbeg, um, because of the, the size of the two distilleries, even though when you look at the size of, you could take Glen Morangy and add its production to Ardbeg's production, and it wouldn't be, it still would not be that of like a Glen Fittick or a Glen Levitt, right? Um, Glen Morangy makes about 6.2 million liters of spirit annually. Uh, that might be a little conservative. Maybe call it 6.4. Um, and Ardbeg will make about 2.3 million liters of spirit now that we have the uh, the new distillery, um, the new stillhouse operational. 
up until last year, Ardbeg had operated on a set or a pair of, of single stills, one wash and one spirit still, and was only able to make about 1.6 million liters. Now we have two sets of stills, so two wash, two spirit stills, but that didn't effectively double our capacity. It gave us, what, about 70% 70, 70 more distilling capacity until we optimize it all the way. And there is hope that the distillery's maximum output will be about 2.8 million liters of spirit, hopefully by 2025 or 2026. Well, I can, I feel like I can speak for all of us. Um, we fully are prepared to meet the demand and continue to drink you dry. So don't worry about that. <laughs> um, we actually have a comment from Graham who was in our last round of certification. Uh, when you were talking about water being a better solution for pulling out tannins and alcohol being better for pulling out lignans, um, would you suggest that lower ABV solutions and barrels will pull out more of a tannic character into the finished product? Mm -hmm. I, I would, I would definitely suggest that. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, even though the state of American, um, or I should say, even though the state of sherry, sherry cask is, is ever changing, um, one of the interesting things that, that you see, I think sherry casks are a really great example of this based on the chewiness, right, and the resinous qualities. Those come into solution in two different ways, more or less. The first is through the, the previous occupant lending some of itself to us as, as the drinker and the consumer of single malt scotch whiskey. With sherry casks, there's, a, there's the idea or the narrative that the previous occupant has given some, some of itself to that cask as well. Um, that is very different than the subtractive nature of a bourbon barrel, where it's all about what the bourbon has taken out of the cask not necessarily what is, what is left in solution back in the cask there. Um, the other element of that, the other area of that would be oak derived tannins, right? Um, oak derived tannins and then plus, uh, plus residuals coming from the previous occupant. That's what makes sherry casks so chewy as we oftentimes refer them to them as. Um, we always say like, oh, this is a really chewy whiskey. Like I can, I can kind of feel it. And what's really happening is, as we discussed this yesterday, on our on our closed on our on our class with the um, with all the students, one of the things we discussed is that there's the perception of chewiness that's coming from the organoleptic profile of the whiskey. So when you smell it or you nose it, your olfactory bulb is communicating with your memory, and one of the strongest memories that a lot of us have from from childhood is eating those little boxes of raisins, eating things like dates. Um, like prunes, like figs, maybe even fig jam as well. And that communicates a chewiness to us. So yes, actually in the end drink, there is oak derived tannin. There's also probably fruit derived tannin from the previous occupant as well. And, and then subconsciously, our mind is telling us because there are those key signifiers, our mind is telling us, wow, this whiskey is chewy. And that's how we kind of get there. Yeah. Excellent. Great question, though. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'll keep keep on pushing on there. So at Ardbeg, as as anybody who's in the course or has previously gone through the course will know, of course, we have the three main whiskeys in Ardbeg's core range, Ardbeg 10-year-old, Ardbeg Wee Beastie, and then the iconic Ardbeg NO back here as well. So those three whiskeys make up the monsters of smoke. Those are three whiskeys within the greater, I would say, um, core range of the distillery. But the core range of the distillery doesn't just stop there. We then have Ardbeg Ugedal as well as Ardbeg Kori Vrecken, which are two, uh, which are two absolutely just phenomenal drams in the Ardbeg core range. Together, this core range is the most highly decorated core range of whiskeys on the planet, winning four-time World Whiskey of the Year, three-time World Whiskey of the Year in, in ooh, sorry, let's flip those, three-time <laughs> World Whiskey of the Year in Ardbeg Ugedal, and three-time World Whiskey of the Year in Ardbeg Cory Vrecken as well. So together, the distillery has actually won World Whiskey Distillery of the Year five out of the last, uh, sorry, five out of the last eight years and six times since we relaunched the distillery in 1997. 
which make us the most heavily uh, heavily awarded and highly awarded distillery on the planet since we relaunched the distillery as well. So times of really great success. And one of the things I love about the distillery is the fact that it does make these whiskeys that we can count on, that we can catalog uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're somebody like me and you love jumping in between each of these whiskeys, each of these whiskeys is their own self-contained adventure. When you, when you talk about Ardbeg as a distillery and you have kind of a, a discussion about the 10-year-old, the 10-year-old acts as basically the, the tapestry or even the, yeah, the, I think that's probably pretty fitting, the tapestry, if you will, for Ardbeg as a distillery. These four whiskeys and actually even these limited releases as well, pull at an individual thread within the tapestry and take it in a completely different direction. So when you follow that through line and follow that thread back, the core underpinnings are that you are drinking in Ardbeg. And we know that because of the familiarity that is built on the Ardbeg 10 year old, or at least in the whiskeys that are aged in nothing but ex bourbon barrels. That's how we get the truest nature of the distillery itself. But then some interesting things happen when you add maybe something like 60% ex bourbon barrel in the case of Ardbeg Anno, 20% all or 20% Pedro Jimenez sherry cask and 20% virgin American oak. And something like Wee Beastie, the familiarity is again based on ex bourbon barrel maturation. But then you also have 40% of that whiskey that is aged in refilled Oloroso sherry casks. And something like Ardbeg Ugadol, which is 2021's World Whiskey of the Year last year, you have about 70 to 80% ex bourbon barrel, 20% matured wholly in Oloroso sherry casks. And then, of course, in Ardbeg Cory Vrecken, which was World Whiskey of the Year in 2017, the last time that whiskey won that award, um, this is about 70% ex bourbon and about 30% virgin European oak casks. So it's easy to see how the 10 year old kind of makes up the through line of everything that we do at Ardbeg Distillery. Now, if you don't mind, I would love to roll this wonderful clip that we have of Dr. Bill and Jillian um, actually at Ardbeg Day discussing Ardbeg 10 years old as they were getting ready to launch the taste bud, taste, taste bud puncturing Ardbeg Ardcore. All right, let's watch. Happy Ardbeg Day, one and all. I'm Dr. Bill Lumsden, master distiller for Ardbeg, and with me today is Gillian McDonald, our master blender. Now, welcome to the main event, and the time has almost come for us to taste the star of the show, the mighty Ardcore. Thank you, Bill. And that's right, the final act is just waiting in the wings, and the uncorking of Ardcore is just a few sips away. However, we must do right by this incredible malt, and knock back some of the smoky originals that have paved the way. So we have Ardbeg 10 and Ardbeg Ugadal to do a comparison to. But before we got onto that, what is it like? How's it felt today to be back on Isla and in amongst the people? Well, you know, it's just absolutely marvellous, Gillian, because this is actually the first time I've been at the distillery on Ardbeg Day for 20 years. Yes. So, you know, it seems almost surreal to yeah, me. Yeah, it must be amazing. And did you get to get about? We've got loads of, we had loads of things out. We had rock tails, the record store. Yeah, I mean, I, I tried a few of the rock tales, the punk group playing there. Oh, so the whole yeah. theme is just, it's jumping. The, the, the distillery and the island are jumping. The atmosphere is incredible. Yeah. So many people <laughs> pilgrimed yeah. over. Yeah. It's a real, uh, real joy. So uh, let's get stuck in then, shall we? And uh, kick things off with the, the benchmark yeah. that is our yeah. big 10. And, you, you know, we, we always use the 10-year-old as our control, so yeah. to speak, the flagship product. And we compare everything else to this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, Ardbeg has always been bottled as a 10-year-old. Mm -hmm. So what I love about the 10-year-old, it's got this real raw saltiness to it. And, you know, it's the, the essence of the distillery and Isla itself. So lovely pale gold colour from the American oak barrels we use. Mm, it's beautiful. <laughs> it, it's really beautiful. And it's one of the things that always astonishes me about Ardbeg whiskies is that we know that the malted barley is amongst the most heavily peated yeah. anywhere in the world for a whiskey. But on the nose to start off with, you think, 
Really? Yeah. It's just so restrained and yeah. so in balance. And I'm just going to add a little bit of water. Would you like some yeah. in yours? As you're at it, yeah. Thank you. It's always so yeah. incredibly fruity on there. That <sighs> lime, those herbal notes. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's no question the purifier on the line arm of the still just yeah. makes it such a complex whisky. But now I'm just getting a little bit of that pungent peat smoke in there. Still a bit restrained, mm. but just wait. But Let's it's taste there. it. Mm. A remarkable sweetness for one or two seconds, and then bang! You yes. just get all these layer after layer of oily, tarry, peat smoke flavours. Yeah, when you breathe in, it's just... <sighs> you know, it's, it's <laughs> espresso coffee, yeah. it's tarry rope, yeah. it's Cuban cigars, Monte Cristo, I think. Of course, and you've and got that medicinal, those medicinal well, notes in there yeah. as well. And it, there, there's something medicinal, almost ever so slightly anaesthetising or soothing about it. Yeah. And then you get that lovely, slightly sweet malted barley base mm -hmm. in there. But it's a staggeringly complex whisky. Absolutely glorious. It really is an yeah. absolute classic. Amazing. And of course, we use this for all of our comparative tastings, for all our experimental, mm. certainly for our, our big day as well. So this is what we benchmark everything mm. against. So as long as it's different from this, then mm. we're, we know yeah. that we're onto something. We've created something that's right. worthy of a release. Yeah, we, 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 we like our releases to have a little bit of this. And you'll yeah. be clearly related yes. to it. But there you have it. Ardbeg 10-year-old, the classic archetypal Ardbeg whiskey. Absolutely. Stunning. Right, well... Love it. Absolutely love getting to hear Dr. Bill and Jillian speak a little bit about the Ardbeg 10-year-old. Was that pretty interesting there, Brittany? I loved it for so many reasons. Um, one, informative, obviously. Um, two brilliant minds discussing whiskey. But I also love how much they embrace the theme of hardcore um, for this art bag day. Um, I, as I'm sure most of you watching know, you know, we work on Camp Ronamuck and Portland Cocktail Week and in the, and with clients. And in the process of that, we, we work a lot with American whiskey. Um, and I love American whiskey. Um, American whiskey distillers <laughs> as a whole. I can't imagine many of them uh, in the getup that Dr. Bill was wearing or for um, the women like Pam from Michter's uh, in the getup that Jillian <laughs> was wearing. Uh, but boy, oh boy, I just love how excited. It's hard not to be excited about the whiskeys when they are so excited. They're like, wait, we get to wear like a fake sternum ring and this is great. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that our fact checker, this is a lot like, I feel like I'm ready for a job with CNN. Um, our fact checker, Leo, dug up some information to the question of Dr. Bill's educational background. So I am going to give you the scoop. Uh, this is breaking news. Um, Dr. Bill Lumsden achieved a BSc in biochemistry and cell biology from Glasgow University. Um, before beginning his PhD in fermentation science at Harriet Watts University's Department of Brewing and Biological Sciences, now the International S Center for Brewing and Distilling. So he has got the credentials to back up that slicked back jet black hairdo <laughs> and all of the delicious whiskeys that we see at Ardbeg. Absolutely. You know, his... Um... His lab, his laboratory uh, at the Cube is what we call it in Edinburgh at, at the home office. So his laboratory uh, at the top floor of the Cube is one of the most amazing places I've, I've ever gotten to spend afternoons. He has small samples from hundreds, hundreds of different casks sitting at, at Ardbeg and Glenmorangie Distillery. He's pulled core samples of them and just has them there at his distillery or at his, at, at his laboratory so that he can actually take a sense check of how the whiskeys continue to mature. And that technique that you saw him employ by adding water to Ardbeg 10 year old, people oftentimes think that the only reason that you would add water to a whiskey is because maybe it's drinking a bit hot. In actuality, the reason that Dr. Bill and Jillian add water to their whiskey 
when they're analyzing or analyzing flavor profile or even analyzing maturation arc uh, of an individual whiskey or even an individual cask is to now be able to see any inherent flaws in the whiskey that may be covered up by the proof itself. So Dr. Bill and the whiskey creation team in general employ a tactic of pouring the whiskey neat by itself and then gradually reducing and, uh, and proofing down in strength so that they can see that, that, they are, that there are no flaws and that the production style has remained consistent. So I oftentimes hear that, you know, that, that there should be batch to batch variants and differences. Absolutely, there should be because this is still an organic process and it's done using only the olfactory system as well as like the papilla of our, of our whiskey creation team. So there will be batch to batch differences, but only three to 4% at most. And that's actually one of my favorite things that I've done a few years ago. We did a tasting that we called 10 by 10, which was our bag 10 year old from 10 different years um, against each other. And it was amazing to see how consistent yet how different the whiskeys all were from each other. I, I love, you know, highlighting stuff like that a little bit too, because so much of what goes into all of the distilled spirit products that, you know, we know and love is science, but so much of it is just that experience and that art and spending every day with a product and seeing how it changes over time and kind of getting that inherent sense of what is benchmark so that you can, you know, you come across a sample and you're like, okay, well, this fits in those parameters that let it be benchmark, even though it has its own characteristics because it's from a different year or, you know, it's from different barrels or from a different part of storage or whatever. Right. Uh, we did have a question um, from Tomoyo. Uh, what's the largest number of casts that get blended together at one time? Mm, that's a really, that is actually a really, really good question. So it'll vary, it'll vary um, depending on, on which mark or which skew we're attempting to bottle, uh, which we're attempting to bottle. So for something like Ardbeg Anno, I know that that is generally done in lots of, in like parch, parchments of about 20 to 25 casts at a time. For something like Ardbeg 10 year old, because there's um, less uncontrollables, because again, it's it's ex-bourbon and we know how ex-bourbon behaves with Ardbeg in it, depending on whether it's first or second or third fill. Generally, the Ardbeg 10-year-old batches are done in, in allotments of about 30 to 35 casts at a time. I no. really appreciate that it just so naturally happened that you referenced N.O., followed yeah. by the phrase, I know, because that's how you taught me to say it in public without embarrassing myself. <laughs> and it only took me about two years to make it a part of my speech pattern. But uh, at first it was a real struggle. Every time I talked to Cam about it, I'd say it wrong. When I wrote emails, I would spell it wrong. Um, <laughs> so I love that that just came up in natural conversation because as soon as you said that, I was like, that's what you taught me. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, one of the other things I will also mention while it's just fresh on my mind as well is you had heard that, um, that Jillian referred to, and she kind of made mention of whenever they go to, to make a new whiskey or design or create a new whiskey, they stress test whatever it is that they're tasting against Ardbeg 10 year old as if it is the baseline or the benchmark whiskey. And as long as what they've made is significantly and notifiably different than Ardbeg 10 year old, they know that they're on the right, that they're on the right path and right direction, right? And why that's so important to me is because then that allows for us to do some really weird and kind of interesting things like what I pulled down onto the table in front of me here as well. So if you go back and you start looking up um, and you were to go on to ardbegproject.com, you would actually be able to look up a list of all of the committee release bottles from 2020 back into about 2002, I believe, um, is the time frame that, that, Ardbeg, uh, that the Ardbeg project actually covers. So 
Our most recent committee bottling is of course going to be Ardbeg Ardcore, this wonderful whiskey with the bright blue punk rock stripe and the, the punk rock underpinnings to it as well. As Dr. Bill said, it's like biting into a spiky metal ball um, and it's taste bud puncturing is kind of the marketing, uh, the marketing jargon that has been applied to the whiskey as well. Now, from, from there, back in 2001 or 2021, uh, what we did is we actually released a whiskey that was called Ardbeg Scorch. This really beautiful bottle right here. I know I don't know why the camera is not auto-focusing. I apologize. But this is a whiskey that was matured in ex-bourbon casks that were heavily, heavily charred. So level five chars, um, which is technically called an alligator char. It also turns out that back in 2011, there was a whiskey that we released that was called Ardbeg Alligator, which is the first time that we had used those casks. So Ardbeg Scorch, the story to go along with that whiskey is that those casks are dragon charred um, at level five. So it's us refilling those same alligator char casks a mere 10 years, uh, 10 years later. And then in 2020, we had a release that was called Ardbeg Black or Ardbeg Black, if you will. And that took some whiskey and matured it wholly in ex-bourbon barrels, very similarly to how we behave and how we know that Ardbeg 10-year-old behaves in ex-bourbon barrels, creating the benchmark and the underpinning of the distillery. But then we also had some whiskey that was wholly, uh, wholly matured in Pinot Noir casks as well. So those Pinot Noir casts coming to us from New Zealand. So that whiskey is supposed to tell the story of yes, the distillery and yes, Ardbeg itself, but then also kind of share center stage with another island being that of New Zealand, another island of which you're actually outnumbered three to one by sheep anytime you're on it as well. You're also outnumbered three to one by sheep anytime you're on Isla as well there. Mm -hmm. I loved, uh, that was one of my favorite things about, about Ardbeg as a young bartender was understanding how the naming and how the idea of how the whiskey creation team put the whiskeys together tells a story that's beyond what just happens in your glass. And you are quite literally blending or weaving these stories together to get there because yes, one part of these whiskeys will always be truly Ardbeggy and that's what's, what's beautiful is that there are always some whiskey matured in ex-bourbon that meets some whiskey that's wholly matured in another style of cask or has a competing idea that's been picked out of uh, Dr. Bill's brain there. I also really love, I know we talk about, we've talked about this a lot on the streams for this round, but I really love um, the collaborations that happen between the whiskey creation team and the Ardbeg marketeers to craft stories around the whiskeys because the whiskeys themselves are already really compelling, uh, but to help everyone else who isn't, you know, in Dr. Bill's lab kind of connect those dots and be like, oh, like I understand what this is, like just from for, participating kind of in the marketing or looking at the label, things of that nature. I understand what this is and that it's going to be different from a benchmark like the Ardbeg 10, but it's still going to have that like essence of Ardbeg, which is the thing I know and love. Absolutely. You know, the day that we make Ardbegs that, that don't capture the essence of the distillery and almost even more importantly, the, the essence of the people that work at the distillery and the people that live on the island as well, that's the that's the day that I think that we've done a disservice to our bagas and distillery. You know, even whiskeys like even though I didn't pull it down here, um, there's one upstairs that's called Ardbeg Blasda, which is a lightly peated Ardbeg, but it's still very clearly Ardbeg. There's something about it that even when you're drinking it, it, it tells you it screams the name Ardbeg at you, even though it doesn't have the necessarily uh, necessarily the phenolics that most of the other whiskeys have at Ardbeg. It doesn't, it doesn't have that phenolic compound. It doesn't have all that phenol and peat smoke, but you do get to see the waxiness of the, uh, of the fermentation tanks and what that does to, to the Ardbeg new made spirit. You get to see the, you know, the, the, the fruity underpinnings of the distillery that are kind of bolstered by distillation in a spirit still that has a purifier on it. You know, so in, in ways you still know that you're drinking an Ardbeg. Your brain is still telling you you're drinking an Ardbeg. It just doesn't have to be heavily peated to do it. Or 
or we can take you the other direction and do something like supernova, which is peated beyond all beyond all belief, but then still has the DNA of the distillery at the same time. Peated beyond my belief, beyond belief is uh, the exact kind of world I'm trying to live in. So I love that, but definitely would love to try that Blasto one day. That's I I love to see all of the fun things that y'all come up with, and how the team works together to continue to capture that essence, but to keep things new and fun for all of the people that we've talked about that have become so emotionally invested in the brand, um, and you know that are always looking for things that are up for conversation from Dr. Bell. Uh, mm-hmm. I know we're nearing the end of our time and there's a, there's one question I'm going to say for the end. That one's from Jason Davis. It's one that I can answer. It's a logistical question. Uh, but this one from Daniel Carlson. I know we've talked a lot about maturation and how it's a part of this whole blending process, which I feel like, Leo, you're probably going to have to go back and bleep out every time Cam and I have said blending during this video before Dr. Bill gets his eyeballs on it. But um, he remembers hearing at Old Forester that they use cedar chips and cattail stalks to seal leaks in their barrels. Does Ardbeg use the same materials or is there something different? Mm, That's quite interesting. I've actually, um, I haven't seen too many casts with major leaks at Ardbeg unless they are something of, uh, unless it's an oak that is non-traditional. So like years ago, we had a whiskey that we released as Ardbeg Kelpie that was matured in oak from the Adagi forest, um, basically uh, off of the Black Sea. Um, And those casks had a bit of a, uh, the, uh, a bit higher of a, an evaporative loss. So the angel share was a little bit higher in those. And then also there was some closure, some sealing issues that they had as well. Um, so I remember that they had used reeds, but I'm not sure which kind of reeds they had actually used, what the, what the wood was actually made of. Um, but I do remember seeing in some of the casts that there were these little slivers that they had basically nailed in and then sawed off. Uh, to stop the the, the loss of, of spirit out of the cask. Um, at Glen Morangie, they just used, uh, I don't want to give away all of the, the secrets that are happening at Glen Morangie and Ardbeg, but there were some casks that were um, incredibly rare and very, very valuable to the business of Glen Morangie that when we were over, one of our ambassadors, Travis Tidwell, who's based in um, Los Angeles, said, that looks like it's leaking, we should grab somebody. And we're very glad that we did because it turned out that two of the casts had actually emptied themselves onto the floor. Mm, You never want whiskey on the floor. That's not where it goes. (laughs) That's not where it goes. That's not where it goes at all. Excellent. Well, Cam, do you want to talk, are there any more products from the kind of like special release line that you want to go through today? Or do you want to just leave everyone frantically searching for Ardbeg Project's website and dreaming that their bar was stopped? Yeah, I would say um, one of the best things that you can do to become very well versed, maybe not necessarily on the whiskeys that we you, that we have put out, but the future whiskeys for, from Ardbeg is to really just join the Ardbeg committee at ardbeg.com. Um, the committee members are who we communicate with before anything else, uh, whenever we're going to release a new whiskey. And you may notice that these committee bottles that I've brought down here, the ones that are Ardbeg day releases and that are committee bottles are bottled and have a white label The ones that are Ardbeg Day releases but are not committee bottles, we call them limited editions, committee limited editions. These limited editions have a black label. The committee bottlings always have a white label. So the committee bottlings are always done at a little bit higher proof. So we'll technically release the same whiskey twice, one at or around cast strength, at or or around cast strength, And then the one with the black label will always have a bottling proof of 46% alcohol by volume. It does mean that they're two very different experiences of the same whiskey. We make a lot less of the committee bottlings. So it's always really, really helpful to be current 
and checking your email when the Art Bank committee emails you so that then you can go to your store and say, hey, or your distributor and say, hey, I know this is coming out. I'd really like to take allocation of this because if you don't, then Ardbeg now is the second most collected whiskey in the world behind the Macallan, um, who makes some um, some delicious whiskeys that are that are highly highly hyped and, and collected as well. Um, so the Macallan whiskeys are are and also the Ardbeg whiskeys at auction fetch incredible incredible prices. And as people who want to drink the whiskey, um, I'd rather see it get into your hands rather than it go to the whiskey flippers. Uh, the flipping industry, I, I think we've all had enough of the whiskey flipping industry. Um, so staying current on your Ardbeg and Ardbegian emails from the committee is the best way to ensure that you don't have to pay secondary market prices uh, for your Ardbeg committee bottlings. And I'd rather that you have the, drink, the whiskey than anybody else on the planet. So I love that. that. So go over to Ardbeg.com and sign up for the committee. So that way, you know, when things are coming out, I know Cam was able to get uh, the A team at the spring session of camp, which is sponsored by Ardbeg, a little bit of hardcore, but I also know it wasn't the easiest process in the world because so many people are trying to get their hands on it when it comes out. So go sign up and make sure you're the first to know and then invite me over so <laughs> that we can try it. Um, well, I'm going to wrap up with this last kind of logistical question then, and we'll let everybody get back to their day. Um, Jason, if you posted a question, if you emailed me a question, and this goes for everybody about your final, um, make sure that any questions about your finals are directed to Kirsty from Edinburgh Whiskey Academy. Um, if you did not take down Kirsty's email during our mixer, or maybe you lost it or whatever, that's totally fine. You can go to the community chat function on the EWA page um, and put your questions there. Just make sure they go to Kirstie. Unfortunately, I don't have access to like the back end, uh, like the scheduling part of the EWA platform. Um, and so I can't change it for you and I don't wanna hold up your process because uh, I want you to get your piece of paper. So just make sure you contact Kirstie. Kirstie will get you sorted out. She is. She's in charge for a reason. So she's the person you want to talk to anyway. And Riley, absolutely, our big party at your house. 10 out of 10. Love good luck. Um, well, Cam, thank you so much for pulling down all these special bottles today and talking to us about the art of blending <laughs> at our bag and all the wonderful people involved in it and letting us see Dr. Bill uh, in that fantastic outfit. <laughs> I loved every minute of it. Um, and before you go, if you enjoyed this class today, make sure you hit the like or love button on whatever platform you're watching on and leave some love in the comments for Cameron, who every day he's forced to spend his entire Wednesday with me. So tell the guy he did a good job. Uh, make sure you follow us at PDXCW on Instagram. That's how you will see what is coming up next. Um, if you have not liked, subscribed, followed all of those things to our Facebooks and our YouTubes, do that. They're both PDXCW. Um, you're probably already watching on one. Make sure you follow Cam on Instagram because he's cool and posts cool pictures and they usually have whiskey in them. So follow Ardbeck Cam. And once again, tomorrow is when Portland Cocktail Week IRL applications close and we will be drinking Ardbeg at Portland Cocktail Week. Don't miss it. Fill out your form. With that, have a wonderful Wednesday, Scotch students. Make sure you are studying and getting ready to ace that test. And we will see you back here for our last public class of this round next week. Bye.